during my lifetime, CO2 levels in the atmosphere have climbed from 325 to nearly 420 parts per million. The temperature of the planet has increased by half a degree. Sea levels have risen by over five centimeters. And I'm not even that old. I was born in Viti Levu in Fiji in April 1973, which at that time was a lush island surrounded by vibrant tropical coral reefs. The island is still green, but the storms are stronger, the droughts longer, and Fiji's coral coast no longer seems to host any coral. I grew up partly in Peru, where my father worked as a geologist in the high Andes. Many of the glaciers that he marveled at that fringed the icy peaks of the Cordillera Blanca have gone too, just like the Fijian corals. And the streams that those glaciers fed have begun to dry up, and ominous new lakes have begun to fill in the high valleys. When I began my career as a climate writer, these kinds of things were so new that they were hardly believed. Now they're so old that they're barely news at all. Floods, droughts, wildfires, whatever. The climate emergency has become a daily routine which is almost mundane. Meanwhile, the natural world has been decimated. Areas of Peru that were jungle when I lived there are now open farmland. In neighboring Brazil, it's even worse. Since the year of my birth, more than 400 million hectares of tropical forests have been lost worldwide. That's more than the entire landmass of India. Across the globe, mammals, birds, fish, amphibians, and reptiles have lost two thirds of their wild populations since 1970. My lifetime parallels the rise of the modern environmental movement. E.F. Schumacher wrote, Small is beautiful in the year of my birth, 1973. Friends of the Earth was formed just a few years earlier, and Greenpeace was founded in 1971. As I grew up, these, the work of these organizations gave me hope. As a, even as a child, I was a committed environmentalist. I worried about acid rain, about pesticides, and about the pollution of our local river in the English Midlands. In 1987, I did a high school project on what was still then known as the greenhouse effect. At university, I founded an environment page at the student newspaper, and when I left in 1995, I joined Earth First in the treetops and in the tunnels of the British countryside to stop roads, resorts, and airport runways that were destroying what then remained of our forests. Then in the late 1990s, I heard about genetic engineering and helped to steer the direct action movement to stop GMOs by direct means. We destroyed them wherever we could, in the labs and in the fields. I co-organized the first action against Monsanto in England, getting busloads of activists to their headquarters and taking it over. We wore underwear outside our trousers and were called Superheroes Against Genetics, or SHAG for short. Although I took history and politics at university, I always had an unrequited passion for science. And when I started work on my first climate book, I plunged happily into the process of reading hundreds of peer-reviewed papers in obscure academic journals. Now in those days, they weren't even online, so I had to go along dimly lit shelves in the basement of Oxford University's Radcliffe Science Library and find bound copies of each journal article. When my writing was published, I found myself defending science from climate deniers. I went on TV, on the radio, and I'd always have to respond to attacks from people who say that the climate are not changing or that it's just natural cycles or whatever other bullshit excuse came into their heads. And this is where the science came in. Yes, it might be snowing today, I told them, but the plural of anecdote is not data. Evidence matters. Peer review matters. Scientific consensus matters. Yes, the fact that every major scientific organization in the world signs up to this 99% consensus on climate warming, that matters. 
And so when the day came when I realized I was on the wrong side of scientific consensus, this time on the issue of GMOs, I was uniquely vulnerable. I thought I was on team science. And now I was like, no, what do you mean it's a bad idea to trash crops and smash up labs and destroy scientific experiments? It's a bit like that Mitchell and Webb sketch where they're two SS officers, have you seen it? And they're like, we've got skulls on our caps. Are we the baddies? <laughs> and of course, in, in retrospect, it was an obvious contradiction. I couldn't go on TV and say with a straight face, you should listen to the scientific consensus on climate change, but you should ignore the equivalent scientific consensus on, on GMOs. But that's exactly what Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, and it seemed like the entire environmental movement that I'd always admired and identified with was doing at the time. And it wasn't just GMOs. I'd been in the climate activist scene for more than a decade before anyone made the point to me that nuclear power produces substantial amounts of carbon-free electricity, and this might not be such a bad thing. And yet, when I tried to talk about these issues, I was shut down. No discussion was allowed. It was virtually taboo. So it took a, it took a few years for me to pluck up the courage to go public, and when I did, in that speech on GMOs at the Oxford Farming Conference in 2014, the response was immediate. Now I was a Monsanto shill, photoshopped onto a thousand Facebook memes. Friends and colleagues I'd worked with for years actually signed statements of denunciation. It was like Maoist China. Literally, I would, people would cross the street in my home in Oxford. They wouldn't even look at me. But at the same time, emails started coming in from scientists around all, of, all around the world, even from the head of the US Association for the Advancement of Science, saying, thank you. And they shared with me their own despair at the environmental movement and how it seemed to have lost touch with science and seemed to be consumed by romantic fantasies bearing no relation to the realities of the modern world. So I tried to persuade other Greens, but no one was listening. I felt actually very alone. And I know many of you in this room have had similar experiences. And it does, it really upends your worldview because you're being asked, as an environmentalist, to believe something that makes literally no sense. Why could I not be both pro-climate and pro-nuclear? Why not pro-GMO and pro-biodiversity? Why were these people on different sides of the argument, all stuck in their trenches? Now, I'm sure each of us has our own story of how this happened to themselves personally, but for me, this was when I realized there was a need to rebuild the environmental movement from the ground up. And over the years, as I met many of you in this room, and I went around doing talks, attending events, and so on, I saw that all the different elements that we needed for this new environmental movement were already out there, that I wasn't alone, and that what we desperately needed was to bring people together into a, mo a new movement that was both pro-science and pro-environment. Now, I also traveled around Africa and saw at first hand how subsistence farmers whose kids were clearly malnourished were desperate to be allowed to access the new drought tolerant crops. And yet anti-GMO groups egged on by Western NGOs steeped in organic ideology and with seemingly plenty of money, these groups spread myths about cancer, infertility, and even, get this, the new GMO crops would turn your kids gay. And I began to feel ashamed that these people spreading homophobic anti-science myths in Africa ever called themselves environmentalists and had even once potentially been... I saw the same in Bangladesh, where the anti-GMO groups were going around to farmers who were cultivating insect-resistant Bt brinjal, and they were telling them it would cause paralysis. Instead, these environmentalists were saying, don't use the GMOs, keep using the powerful pesticides, which actually are carcinogens, because otherwise the farmers would get no crop. And I was saying to myself, wait a minute, these people are anti-GMO and pro-pesticide, 
that surely a science-led environmental movement would be pro-GMO and anti-pesticide. It's actually not that complicated, but why isn't it happening? I also visited Chernobyl and Fukushima and saw the legacy of decades of anti-nuclear hysteria in the lives of hundreds of thousands of people torn apart by the fear of radiation. And I saw that Greenpeace and the Greens in Germany were using the tragic deaths of 18,000 people killed in a tsunami as a way to shut down our largest source of 24-7 zero carbon baseload power. And I saw Germany marching inexorably towards the tragedy that we're seeing today where they're shutting down nuclear plants in order to deliver the energy future into the eager hands of Vladimir Putin. And I thought, why can't I be pro-renewables, pro-nuclear, and anti-Putin at the same time? Why set one against the other? And yet the wind and solar people all hated nuclear and were prepared to put up with Russian gas in preference to that. And the nuclear people all hated wind and solar, but they liked Russian reactors, by the way. And the whole climate emergency thing seemed to just be an afterthought. To uh, adapt from a title of a book by Naomi Klein, it was like climate changes everything except any of our minds. Science, it always seemed, was overlooked or invoked only as a way to justify pre-existing or predetermined ideological positions. Yet I'd learned the hard way that science should be more than just a list of citations conveniently cherry-picked to buttress an argument. True science represented the process of producing hypotheses and subjecting them to critical examination using robust and objective evidence in a replicable manner. You all know the story. To see so many environmentalists not just being selective with the science, but rejecting it altogether as some kind of post-colonial leftover made me realize that something much greater was at stake. For if we can't use science to identify problems, let alone solve them, we're left with nothing. An amorphous post-truth miasma of competing ideologies, a morass of misinformation with arguments won by those who shout the loudest, make the most extreme claims, or win the most converts. It would be like a Russell Brand YouTube video that goes on forever. And science isn't just for the global north, science is for everyone. Science is the drought-tolerant seeds that the farmers I met in Tanzania wanted to plant to feed their kids. Science is the climate models that give us an incredible ability to reliably forecast our hotter future. Science is our ability to sequence the genetic material of an emergent virus and design an mRNA vaccine in a matter of days to save the world from a pandemic. An environmental movement that selectively rejected science would not only be unable to solve real world environmental challenges, it would pose a serious threat of making things worse. For example, an unscientific overestimation of the dangers of radiation has, in my view, locked in a substantial part of today's global temperature increase because the hundreds of planned reactors that were canceled after the anti-nuclear movement began were replaced with coal. Now, I could whinge on about this forever, and believe me, I'd like to do that. But at the same time, many of us in the pro-science movement were realizing that we needed to say something positive. It's easy just to complain, to troll, and to criticize, but we needed a vision, something which could inspire a manifesto, perhaps, for an environmental movement which would be technology-friendly, which would be science-based, progressive, even, you might say, modern. And so we called it eco-modernism, which was a good name for what was distinctive about the philosophy, but it wasn't quite right because for me, it seemed like there was a lot of modernism and not much eco. So when we came together for that meeting in Antwerp, back in the dark days of COVID, I think many of us were ready to, to try something different. And this turned into Replanet. Not just a disparate movement, but a professionally organized network of activists in multiple countries, global north and hopefully in the future also the global south, dedicated to overtaking mainstream green thinking, not just in science, but in ambition. 
for example, why not have a moonshot program for renewables and SMRs combined? And why not have an earlier net zero date as a result, like 2040? If we want to harness modern molecular biology, why not use it in precision fermentation and other microbial pro approaches that can deliver animal type proteins and fats without the appalling suffering and the environmental destructiveness of industrial animal agriculture? When Putin invaded Ukraine, it became obvious to everyone but the German Green Party why closing nuclear had been such a calamitous mistake. As public opinion in Europe and elsewhere strung, swung dramatically in favor of nuclear power, we emphasized, we in Replanet emphasized, that solidarity with Ukraine meant switching off Putin, not in three years like the EU was proposing, but immediately, and that keeping the lights on would mean stopping the nuclear shutdowns and taking at the same time drastic energy saving and energy sharing measures across Europe. We scored a big victory in the EU taxonomy debate, which now of course considers nuclear appropriate for EU green financing. We saw the Green Party in Finland taking an overt pro-nuclear stance, joined by members of Fridays for, the F Fridays for Future here in Poland and elsewhere. In our campaigns, we tried to showcase and highlight our positive vision. Our movement in Sweden has sent trucks of aid to Ukraine. We've campaigned to protect old growth forests here in Poland, to protect wolves in Scandinavia and to promote rewilding everywhere. We've opposed fossil fuels, and some have even spent time in prison for taking these beliefs to the street. I salute them for their bravery and their courage because that is what Replanet should stand for. We fought to give genes a chance in making European agriculture more sustainable, and we've campaigned for animal-free and farm-free foods instead. We've opposed the absurd situation where trees are clear-cut in North America, imported into Europe, and burned in power stations to be counted towards renewable energy targets. That's what Replanet does. We love wild nature, but we hate poverty. We believe in democracy, we believe in freedom, we believe in progress. We follow the science and we'll change our minds again when the science demands it. We're animal lovers, we're geeks, we're empiricists, we're vegans, we're queers, we're everyone who believes we can have a better future and wants to help build it. That's Replanet. So, I for one, no longer feel lonely. I no longer feel I have to choose between science and environmentalism. I now feel part of something bigger, something of historical significance, something that you're all part of too, and that is Replanet. Thank you.